The seven step method is a method of doing PBL that was pioneered by a Dutch scientist called Henk Schmidt. He wanted to help structure PBL for students who were too young to know how to organize their learning by themselves. So what is the seven step method? The seven step method consists in seven systematic steps that help you to tackle a problem in an organized way. The first five steps are in what is called a discussion phase. Then there is a week or a few days that you spend at home doing self-study with online resources, for instance, or books. And then there is a seventh step, which is what is called the reporting phase. So in effect, the PBL is split into two parts. The first step in the seven step method is simply to read through the problem or, for instance, look at a video or some pictures that are in the problem and then to Describe what you see to make sure everybody has the same understanding of the problem. If there are any terms that are unfamiliar, they should be looked up or defined by people in the group who do know what they mean. The second step is a bit more tricky to get your head around, and this is the step in which you define the problem. Because in a PBL problem, they don't just ask you questions or give away the problem. You actually have to find out what is the phenomenon that this problem wants us to talk about or wants us to understand. So that needs a little bit of investigation on part of the students who will have to ask questions such as, what is this really about? What are the key elements in this problem that we need to look at and investigate? And this could lead to a list of questions that the students have. In step three, it's time for all the students in the group to get together and brainstorm ideas that could be answers to the questions from the problem definition. It's usually recommended that there is, if there is a long list of questions, those questions be condensed into key areas of investigation. The students should not, at this point, be stopped from proposing ideas even if they seem outlandish. This is just a brainstorm, and students shouldn't launch into debates or investigations of what they are actually discussing, because this is only a brainstorm. Step four is one of the hardest steps to implement because it involves an analysis of the problem and many students will find it difficult to go beyond the ideas that they just had in the brainstorm. But this step is crucial in order to activate the prior knowledge of students. In this step, students have to make a systematic inventory of all the ideas that they have had in the brainstorm and start delving further into these ideas. Now, the tutor will really help here by asking so-called Socratic questions, which help the students to go beyond and reach the limits of their prior knowledge. Some of these sessions can be very intense as students really dig to see how far they can go, how many hypotheses they can generate about this phenomenon that they're investigating. There are different ways to structure this. You could either use a table or a mind map or any other kind of way that facilitates having a systematic discussion. Step five wraps up this discussion phase by developing what are called learning issues or learning goals. These are usually three, four or five questions that the students take home about the problem which they were not able to resolve in the class itself. So this would be, for instance, I need to look up such and such theory or such and such author or um, I need to find out how this works or that works. Uh, and those are the learning issues that they will take into the self-study phase and then try to answer when they get back into class for step seven. Step six is pretty self-explanatory. It's called self-study because the students have to leave the classroom and then go find books, journal articles, scientific literature, videos that will answer the learning goal. It's very important to train your students in identifying reliable and unreliable resources for this because when PBL was started, there was no internet and so it meant that the students would have access to textbooks that were reliable by definition. But nowadays with the internet, it's very easy for students to go and find any which answers 
uh, online and not necessarily know if an answer is reliable or not. So there has to be some training of students as to what constitutes a legitimate academic source. It is recommended that you do give a literature list to your students or recommend uh, videos or resources that they could use in order that they do not stray too far from what are the intended learning outcomes of the course. Now, it would be very easy to just say, OK, I trust that the students have done their reading. We don't need to come and discuss this. But you do need to make sure that the students have understood what they have read and that they are able to explain it in their own words. This is why we have a step seven, where students come back into the classroom with what they have read, and then they have to discuss it with each other. Now, this doesn't mean that they simply read from their notes or uh, read long passages of text that they don't actually understand themselves. That doesn't make for a nice discussion for anyone. What needs to happen is that the students should be able to put their notes away and actually explain the ideas, the theories, the, the models that they have seen and be able to talk about that with those students, show it, draw it on the board, etc. Uh, and that really is what generates deep learning.